My name is Dr. Charlene Ortiz, also known as Dr. Shar, and I am a doctor in clinical psychology with a specialty in forensic psychology. This video is intended to show us what is scientific literature, how does an article look like, what benefits do we have in reading an article from scientific literature. In this video, you'll also find what parts or components does an article have? Why are they important for practice? Generally, this video is focused for people who are brand new to the field. So for example, someone who is trying to become familiar with the social sciences and its literature. However, if you're part of other sciences, for example, biology, physics, and things of that nature, I also welcome you if you're new to this experience and how to gather data and how to find information that's readily available to you at your fingertips. So let's get started. So the point of this presentation today is to you for you, I should say, to become familiar with scientific literature. More importantly, I would like you to understand how to read a journal from a scientific article. Now, the first thing that I would like to mention is what is a peer review journal? Well, peer review journals are intended for persons who have been scrutinized by their work. So for example, when we propose a scientific journal, when we propose an article or a research study, the main and most important factor is to have it reviewed. Why is that important? Well, the process involves that we are going to revise an article, first and foremost, to understand if there's any form of bias, for instance, or if in there's any case of, for example, the person is trying to forge their data to substantiate their hypothesis or to substantiate the importance of their study. So peer review assures us that the paper that you are reading in a journal is, has been scrutinized and that you can actually understand that this paper has been reviewed by other people, generally with, within the same field. Now, the importance of this is that generally the people who critique the work are persons who are other science, scientists, I should say. This happens before the publication process. This is important because another group of your peers, for example, if you're publishing in psychology, other persons who are familiar with psychology will then review your paper. Now, there's multiple steps that are involved in regards to publishing a paper. The first step would be, let's complete the paper. Let's actually conduct a research and say, my paper is completed. Now I have to submit it to a publisher. In this sense, once each publisher would have their own requirements as to what is acceptable for their specific journal. So they will have formatting, they will have requirements, word requirements, word count requirements, type of research that is conducted, for example, qualitative or quantitative, which you will see a very in-depth definition of these terms in another video. Now, once you submit your journal, or I should say your article to this journal, there's multiple steps that the paper has to go through before it is admitted. Generally, this paper will be given to a person. This person will be the editor. Now, there's multiple ways that your paper can or cannot be accepted. So the first thing that we would like to, to talk about is the action editor. Now, the action editor is the person that will take a look at your article and decide whether or not it fits this journal or if it's scientifically sound. For instance, that it does follow the scientific method. Now, many things can happen in this process. For example, the first thing that can happen is a desk acceptance. What do we mean by a desk acceptance? In this regard, what happens is the individual will receive your paper, will sit down and find there's nothing wrong with your paper. It meets all the requirements for that specific journal and it's scientifically sound. So, and also I should say, it adds to the contribution of the field. It contributes to the knowledge of the field. So for example, if you're publishing something in physics, your study actually contributes to the growth of that field. And the same would apply to the social sciences. I have to say, however, 
that type of acceptance is immensely rare. Generally, papers are not accepted in one go. It usually takes a little bit longer than just having the paper fall on the editor's lap and that that person will accept it from the get-go, as you would say. Now, generally, what does happen is the desk reject. What does that mean? A desk reject, what it implies is that this person will look at the article and say, it is not well written, or for example, it has to be rejected immediately because it's simply not acceptable, whether it be because it wasn't scientifically sound or because it doesn't meet the formatting standards of that particular journal. But just like with our other instance of acceptance, this type of, re of rejection, it's immensely rare. Generally, before any research is even conducted in the first place, it has been scrutinized before it's even written down and sent to a journal. So keep in mind that this type of rejection is also very rare. What generally happens is that your paper will be submitted by a person who will review it. And what do I mean by that? Generally, that's where the process of the peer review will begin. So your paper will be given to someone who is knowledgeable in your field. This paper will be given generally to three other persons to either read and scrutinize your paper or in some cases to replicate your study. What does it mean to replicate? When we replicate something, it simply means that the person is going to conduct the study in the same fashion, in the same exact way that you conducted your study. That way we can see if there's any inconsistencies, for example, in your paper. Now, generally when this happens, the journal will contact you and let you know, hey, we want some revisions conducted in your paper. And generally once you conduct that revision, then you can resubmit and that paper will be accepted for publication, I should say. Now, what is a journal? Right? When we talk about a journal, what do we mean by that? So a journal is a compilation, right? It's a, a generally a periodic, periodic presentation, I should say, of research articles that have been conducted during that time. Generally, these places can come from professional societies. So what do I mean by professional societies? We can have, for instance, we can have journals for general knowledge. So for example, we have APA or the American, American Psychological Association, I should say, or we can also have from the American Psychological Society. So that's one form of publication that we can find. These people will gather data from other researchers and present it to the general scientific community based on that scientific society. Now, we can also find journals that involve the general sense of special subfields. So for example, they have a specific focus, right? They'll have a specific focus of, for example, human factors. They're interested in publication solely on a specific type. So I mentioned earlier, my specialty is forensic psychology. So a journal that specializes in a subfield in forensic psychology, if I were to conduct research, then that in that particular sense, that will be a good bet for me because that journal is interested in a specific subfield. Now, there's other methods to be published. So for example, we can have a publication based on a book. So in that sense, when we are being published by a book, generally we're thinking more on the academic side of things. The one issue that you may encounter in the publication of a book is that in a very broad sense, anyone can publish a book. Any person that has access to a publisher can publish. The limitation with that, however, is that it might not be scrutinized. It, not, it might not be, it might not undergone that process of peer review. So the problem with books and sometimes why professors and instructors like myself don't accept book entries is because generally books are not peer reviewed despite of what authority that may hold. So for example, they're very knowledgeable in their field. 
Irrespective of that, books tend to not be peer reviewed. And because of that reason, we like to go to the sources that are indeed peer reviewed and that have been scrutinized. So the next thing that I would like to talk about is the articles, articles in journals. So when we're talking about that, this slide is basically focused on what category, what category of journals we may find. So for example, an empirical research article, the focus of this particular type of article is that this article focuses on new data. And what do we mean by new data? When we're thinking about new data, it's basically things that have been newly collected. This is brand new to the field, brand new science, brand new research that we are currently either investigating or that it's a new trend in our research. It's basically brand new and we're trying to discover new information or expand upon previous information that was available to the field. So for example, if we have knowledge about learning, right? Or we have knowledge about gravity, if we already have that knowledge, but we have found something new in our research, that would probably be the best type of journal article to publish in. Now, something that I would like to mention is for my students, this would probably be the journal that you would look into for your final paper for our class. Now, moving on into our next type, or category of journals, we're also going to look into what is a review article. Now, the main point of review articles is that they are intended to summarize the data that we have acquired. So for example, it's not very specific. It's actually trying to identify what has been the trend in previous research. What have we seen? What have we collected? what is basically going on in that specific field. So for example, let's think about historically, let's think about historically on what exactly have we seen in regards to research. So at the beginning, we used to have a lot of research, say for example, in the Freudian sense, right? In our, in our very early research in psychology, but now we're moving towards a more biological, cognitive type of field. So think about how that trend has changed and now we're moving towards other fields. So that's basically what that type of journal will be looking into. Now, the other thing that another category that we can look into is the letters to the editor, right? And biographies. This type of publication, it's actually a little bit more rare. A lot of people tend not to publish here because it's pretty specific, right? We're trying to contact the editor. We're trying to do revisions about previous scientific articles. So generally it's not necessarily the most common place to find publications. And our last category or our last source for a journal would be the theoretical model right, theoretical or model papers. Basically, what this does is it provides us with a perspective without collecting new data. Now, this is very important because here we will find, for example, here we find that new data. We find that new source of information, fresh new science, fresh new constructs. Things are brand new to the science. On the other hand, this is simply to provide a perspective without providing new data. We are not focused in providing new information, but rather gaining an insight or understanding of what that new data may be. Now, something that I would like to mention is are how exactly and why do we have to read these papers? Why exactly is it so important for us to look into a journal article from a scientific paper? Why exactly are we focused on that particular presentation and that particular research? Now, why exactly do we do that? 
Well, the thing about that is that when we have access to these materials that have been published in a journal, we are looking for current data. We're actually being exposed to what information is readily available that has been processed through the peer review process. So it actually allows us to understand whether or not there is a consensus. So the first thing that I like to mention is you will, the importance of this falls within having a consensus. So that's the first part. We have a consensus. We have information that can be trusted because it's coming from a peer review source. However, I do want to put a caveat on that trust because science, the only way that science works is with a healthy dose of skepticism, right? If we weren't skeptics about what information is presented, then science couldn't move forward. So for instance, we would still believe that epileptic seizures are caused by demons instead of us thinking now and understanding that it's a, a neuropsychological, it could be neuropsychological, or that can have another uh, source other than something that we cannot test. So it's always good to have that level of skepticism. Now, the other thing would be our consensus, right? When we look at scientific literature, we are focused on the consensus. What are we looking for? What is the general idea? What do we have data for that substantiates our understanding of the world? If we didn't have a consensus, then we would need to conduct more research. We wouldn't simply say we can't do it. On the other hand, Science, what it, it tends to do is find that consensus and see where is this information, where can I find it from, and then we can add to the contribution of that science. Now, another thing is how can you read, how can you read an article? Generally, the first step would be becoming acquainted to or with, I should say, the information that you have available. So let's think about that for a second. So notice that I have put this information here for the students, which is the dictionary for APA. It's always really important for you as a student to become familiar with which terms are the ones that are more commonly found in your field. And if you're not in the field of psychology, this also applies to you. You want to become familiar of what, on what are the terms that your field utilizes. I do have to remind you, that the information from a dictionary may or may not necessarily be information that it's found in scientific language. And what do I mean by that? So for example, there's a very different definition about a theory in the colloquial sense in our everyday words. So colloquial for someone may mean and something that is common, something that we use every day. So say for example, let's think about the word theory, right? For us in our general language, Theory means something that cannot be completely substantiated. So for example, I have a theory on how I'm going to play with a stock market, right? So it sounds like I'm not sure, right? So theory usually sounds like something we cannot substantiate. On the other hand, theory has a completely different meaning in the scientific world. So notice how our understanding of a, of a word in the dictionary sense may not be the same in the, in, in the scientific sense. So even though I am showing you a dictionary that you can tap into and look for, for words that might be a little difficult or might be a little bit more challenging, I do want you to understand that these words are coming from a dictionary, right? And that it may be different for you whenever we start talking about the words and terms or the constructs that are being used in an article. So I do want you to keep that in mind. Now, something immensely important is that it's necessary to understand the definition of a term. Why is that important? Why do we need to understand the definition of a term? Because in order to conduct research, we must define the terms. So for instance, if a psychologist wants to study, say for example, love, how much love do people feel for their children? Well, what is love? right? What exactly do we mean by love? Do we mean about how much time they spend with their children? Do we mean if they buy them things? Do we mean 
in example, how much time they spend planning for activities for their children. So it's immensely important for us to be able to understand terms in a sense that can that it can be used and it can be quantified or investigated so we can draw hypotheses later on. Now, when we are reading an article, the first thing to do, it's always, always, always begin with the abstract. And what is that? What is the abstract? The abstract, when we are looking into an abstract, we are actually looking into the summary, the general summary of what that article is. So something really important, we're going to discuss the parts of an article, and this applies to any article that you may come across with. So here are the following sections of an article, right? The first section that I want to talk about is that abstract, that summary that you're going to find. Generally, an abstract will have in within it the next parts, a very short summary of each of the following parts of, or each of the following sections of that article. So an abstract will include information about the introduction, about the methods used for the study, the results of that study, the discussions or our interpretations, and it would have a summary of all these factors. Why is that important? Well, first of all, when you are reading an article, you're going to come across hundreds and thousands of articles. The problem with that is most people don't have the time to read hundreds and thousands of articles. Because of that reason, whenever you download or whenever you come across a, a journal article, all you have to do is look at their abstract. That's going to give you the information that you need to decide whether or not you want to spend time with that one specific article. It gives you the opportunity to say, hmm, I think that population that, that they studied, I'm interested in that population. So if they're talking about children, if they're talking about inmates, if they're talking about the elderly, then if that's something that interests you or that you may use for further research, then you know that it's a good chance that in reading this article, you're going to get the information that you need without having to read 10, 15, 20 pages. Because an abstract is generally less than a page long. It's usually immensely short. It depends on the journal, of course. And journals have 200, uh, 200 page, uh, word, I should say, word count limits. Some of them have, have 500. But notice that the amount of time you're going to be spending reading an abstract, it's immensely short and immensely small compared to having to read the complete article. So always start with the abstract. It's going to give you a really good summary of what that article is about. Now, let's move on to the rest of the parts. The thing about the abstract is that because it's providing you a summary of each part, it's providing you a summary of all of these parts you are able to get a really good comprehension of what was studied and what is the limitation. We usually want to see what the limitation of a study is because that's what we like to call a gap. That's a piece of information that we're simply not aware of in the scientific community. So it's really interesting to read an abstract because it also gives you the opportunity to find information regarding the limits. Now, another thing about research is that irrespective of which branch are we talking about, irrespective of whether it's a, a medical journal, a physics journal, a psych psychology journal, generally research looks exactly the same from one place to the other. It generally looks exactly the same. And what do I mean by that? Well, that has a lot to do with the structure that we have, the sections that we have about an article. And generally, it starts with your abstract, it goes to your introduction, to your methods, results, and discussion. And finally, it would have your references. Why is that important? Why do we have those sections? Is it arbitrary, arbitrary I should say? If, is there a logic behind that type of structure? Well, interestingly, the reason that we have to show 
information in this regard is that something that we need is structure. We need that type of formatting. Why do we need that type of formatting? Well, it's simply because when we have an opportunity to find information in the same fashion, if I know that the first thing that I'm going to see is the abstract, if I know that the second thing I'm going to see is the introduction and so on and so forth, I know exactly where to look what type of information I'm going to find. So for example, of course, my field is psychology, but say that I'm interested in an article about education, right? Let's suppose that I work in school and I want to find out more information about a specific topic. So for example, some form of learning disability, my best bet is to look into an educational um, section, educational article. So I know that if I look at this article, I will be able to see the abstract first, the introduction second, and so on and so forth. So that's a, a main reason why we need sections in our articles and basically they look exactly the same. And that is beneficial for you because whenever you're gathering your data, whenever you are actually looking into your own processes for your own research, you'll see that articles look exactly the same from one article to the next. Now, the, the other focus of having the same sections is that it allows for science scientists to discover what limitations there may be or what parts feed into one another. So for example, let's look at this section here. So in the middle of your screen. So we see that the hypotheses will be included in the introduction. And that is because the hypotheses is going to later feed what type of design we have. How are we going to conduct this study? Now, the design right here, it's going to feed into how are we going to analyze that information? How are we going to analyze those results? Later on, we see how the results actually feeds into the interpretation. Depending on the results, I'm going to draw conclusions. I'm going to draw conclusions as to how to interpret this, this data. Now, Something interesting about the abstract is whenever you yourself have to write your own abstract, remember the abstract is of course the first part that is going to show up in your article, but it's generally written last. It has to be written last because it is a summary of your paper. It is a summary of that scientific paper that you're reading. So it is impossible to, for example, try to draw a summary if I still don't know what my introduction is going to look like, how my method is going to look like, and the rest of the parts. So it will be impossible to draw and, and write these conclusions and these summaries without those parts being present. So yes, it appears first, but remember that it's going to be written last. Now here's an example of an abstract. And something that I would like you to remember is that the abstract is immensely short. So as you can see, it's simply this square. So it is very small and it's not, it's not particularly extensive, which is a good thing because we don't want to spend a lot of time. We don't want to spend a lot of time trying to read a lot of information without gaining information that could in fact be useful for us or not. So notice how it's giving you information about who the population is. We already know it's talking about college students and we know they're adults. The variables that they were looking into was test anxiety. And what did they do with that test anxiety? Well, they measured and they completed a measure and they were also looking into working memory as another variable. So if we go back into the parts of an article, notice how they are in fact showing you a summary of all of these parts. They're telling you who was involved, what measurements they utilized, and if we keep going further, we can look at their results. So they use a regression analysis to measure test anxiety and the effectiveness of temptation inhibiting implementation of for example, their intentions in the research. So we know what they did to measure the variables and we can see their results. So in this case, we are looking into, say their review was implications for effective self-regulations, 
by test anxious students are discussed. So in this article, you're going to find the results of a study involving test anxious students and what are the implications for their research. So in just a couple of sentences, you're able to understand whether or not this is an article worth your time. Now, the other thing that I would like to talk about is the next section, the next section of, of a research article. And in this case is the introduction. This is where the actual paper begins because remember the abstract is simply a summary. Now, very importantly, very importantly, in the introduction, you're going to find first and foremost, the research topic. We are going to define that topic. And if you remember from earlier, I mentioned that our definitions of terms is immensely important because if we have a good definition, then we will be able to measure this definition, this variable accurately. We'll be able to measure it in accordance to our description. Now, another immensely important aspect of the introduction is it allows us to present and identify the gap in literature. What is the gap? And if you continue in any sort of science, whether it be a soft or hard, hard science, you will never get rid of this term. Identify the gap, identify the gap. What do we mean by that? The gap is basically information that needs to be filled, information that we're simply not aware of and that it, there is a need to understand that gap. So for example, Say, if there's a person who considers that there's a relationship between how they dress and how they conduct a session, right? So for example, if I were a therapist and I show up wearing flip-flops and a t-shirt, what is the perception of the clients, right? So for example, we could conduct a study and identify whether or not this information is needed for the well-being of the science, right? For the well-being of the practice in, in psychology. Now, generally, the other important factor that I'm, I'm going to discuss here in the introduction is the literature review, also known as the lit review. So you, you can use those terms interchangeably. So what do I mean by the literature review? This is when we look at previous research, we are looking into what information is available. So here we were looking into what was unknown, right? What was the gap? But here we're looking into where exactly, what can I do? What can I do to identify what other persons, what other researchers have found that is indeed necessary that I actually need for the presentation of my data? Now, this can help you in many ways. Previous research is going to allow you to not only identify a gap, but it's also going to allow you to find information that is missing, ironically enough. So you're going to be reading a lot of literature in your topic, but it can also tell you what is missing, what is actually not being said. And that's pretty similar to therapy, right? Sometimes therapists are not paying attention so much to what you do say, but what you don't say, right? So that is basically the equivalent of a lit review. Now, the other thing about a literature review is that we're going to find ourselves describing theories or models. We're going to identify these models that allow us to provide an explanation to, for example, behavior. So when we are looking into theoretical models to explain our research, what we are doing is identifying how can we conceptualize, how can we understand a model? So for example, some individuals to explain behavior will use uh, the theory of evolution, right? So they would use a, a combination of, of facts in order to explain research. So in literature review, you're also going to find a description, description, I should say, of models and theories that allow us to conceptualize and understand that research more clearly, right? And also later on, when we get into the results section and the discussion section, you will see how that is immensely relative because we will interpret our data 
based on that theoretical model. So think about it as a scope. Think about it as, as the lenses that you will use to view that information. Now, another thing is that this information here, when we think about other components of the introduction, we're also thinking about the hypotheses. What is a hypothesis? This term gets thrown around by um, in, in colloquial language and everyday conversations. But the idea of a hypothesis, it's a prediction. It's basically an educated guess because we are trying to identify information that we are trying to predict. So for example, at some point, we didn't know what would happen when a person takes a test. So because there was a gap in the literature, right? We didn't know what would happen if a person failed a test and decided to retake this test. So a hypothesis would be the more a person takes a test, the more likely they are to perform better next time, the next time they take it. So notice how that's a prediction. I'm trying to make a prediction based on previous information, observations, and qualitative observation, naturalistic observations, or previous data. So notice that I'm trying to make a prediction in that hypothesis. So every time you look at the term hypotheses, I want you to remember that they're basically predictions. They're basically educated guesses. Now, why do I mean, why do I say it's an educated guess? Well, because it cannot come out of the blue. You actually have to justify, you have to justify the information that you have with previous findings from literature. So you cannot simply say, I think uh, whenever a person retakes a test, they're going to chew gum more. Well, you know, that could be all and well true, but what information do we have to justify that hypothesis? What previous re research substantiates that if you fail a test, you're more likely to chew gum, right? So we would need to find information to substantiate that educated guess or that hypothesis. Now, something really interesting is when you're looking for a hypothesis, so here, this HO, we like to refer as to it as the null hypothesis. And this one here, we like to refer to it as the alternative hypothesis or alternate hypotheses. You can see this depicted as H superscript zero, or, and this you can see it as H superscript A. Now, we usually, when we do a prediction, we always say the direction or what we expect and the complete opposite. So if I think that whenever a person fails a test, next time they take it, they will do better, I can say there is no evidence to support that. So that would be the complete contrary. It wouldn't, the contrary wouldn't be whenever a person retakes a test, they're going to perform worse next time. That would actually be another hypothesis and not necessarily a null hypothesis. Now, something that you need to keep in mind is whatever prediction you're making, generally, we have to ask ourselves, does it follow the literature review? Is it actually founded in other justification from previous research? Now, something really interesting about the, the introduction section is notice that it looks pretty long, but it will only have these components that you're seeing here, right? So it's going to define the topic at hand. It's going to give you a very brief summary of the information that was out there. So for example, the theories and models that we're going to use, and it's also going to have the hypotheses. It's also going to tell you what's going on. So notice how here in the very first sentence is already starting and telling you, hey, this is the obstacle. This is the definition or this is the limitation that we have. This is the gap of the literature that we are trying to find. So notice that at the very beginning, they are already trying to get that attention and say, hey, this is the problem. This is what's going on. Also, the, the other things that you can see is what does previous research say about anxiety and test taking? So notice how they are giving you some historical data. So we're starting to see the lit review section of the introduction. They're telling you about a previous study that was launched in their program, in a previous program. So notice how they're giving you the population. They're also giving you the, the summary of that 
previous review. Now, something that I want to point out is this little number right here, this little number right here. And what do I mean by this number? This number is immensely important. And why do I say that? That number is known as the DOI or the Digital Optic Identifier. Why is that important? Every scientific article will have a DOI. This this information is basically like a serial number. It's a serial number for that article. It's a unique number for that specific paper in that specific journal. So notice how if you're missing, say who the author was, or you want to find that article again and you can't find it, all you have to do is have their DOI. And in that sense, you will be completely able to find that article because that information is solely for that particular article. It's not going to be available for any other article because it's like a serial number. So keep that in mind. The digital object identifier is unique to every single article. Now, if we go again, if we move forward to, if we go back again to the sample introduction, I should say, the other important element of an introduction is that it's going to give you that background. It's going to give you information about what has happened that has led to this study. What type of information do we have for this particular field, for this particular study that we are conducting right now? So think about this. Think about why do I need to provide the background? Well, the background is precisely why you conducted the study in the first place. What led you to believe that this was worth studying? Did you identify a gap? Did you find information that was relevant for the field? So notice how the background is going to give you that information. It's going to tell you what led us here, what took me to this space and saying, okay, I need to look into this and conduct my own research. Or another thing, that's really important about an introduction is the purpose. Why are we doing this in the first place? Why did you decide to conduct an actual research article? Why did you decide to take your time, money, effort, or find an agency or university that will conduct that study? So notice how it also gives us an understanding of what let you here and why are you doing it? So that's a very important part of the introduction. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to have previous research that led to this particular article this time. So you're going to find information about previous research that has been built upon and that hopefully with your research, you're going to be able to build upon the knowledge and the next article is able to build upon the knowledge, so on and so forth, until there, the gap is filled. Sometimes we will be able to find the hypotheses or the research questions within the introduction. You won't necessarily find that all the time. However, it is generally one of the parts that you will find the research question or the hypotheses. So for example, what is the question? And later, what is the prediction, right? So the question is, for instance, test takers. And then my prediction was the when a person fails an exam, the more they take it, the more likely they are to succeed, right? Without studying, right? So just because they decided to retake the exam, then they will be able to take the exam and do better next time. So that was a research question. And now we have a hypothesis, right? We have a prediction of what's going to happen. So now we're going to move towards our next slide. Now, our next slide is talking about the method. This is our next section in a research article. Now, what is a method? A method, it's simply the way, and it's a description of the way the research was conducted. Basically, what did you do? What did you do to conduct this study, right? What did you do to answer the research question and to test what happened to your hypothesis? So, this is a very significant part of your study. One of the things that you're going to find, for example, is the participants, a description of who was involved. Something really interesting, when we use human subjects, we tend to refer to them as participants. However, if it was an animal or um, another, uh, another means, so for example, little critters, rats, things of that nature, we tend to use subjects. Why? Well, we tend to use participants because humans can consent. 
humans can consent to be part or not to be part of a study, whereas animals cannot. So we wouldn't call them participants because they didn't provide their participation, if that makes sense. So we usually refer to animals as subjects and participants. We tend to use that term with humans. So you're going to find a description of the participants in the methods section, but you're also going to find the sample size. What do I mean by sample size? Sample size is the amount of people of that general population that you were looking into how much of that sample did you draw? So let's think about this. For example, you want to conduct a study on inmates, just regular inmates. Okay, what do you mean by inmate, inmates? So we will have to define that term. Does that include people who are arrested? Does that people who are that are in a maximum security prison? Does that include juveniles? So you will have to first identify your population. So we will have to define that big population from where the the sample is going to be drawn for. So if I may, I'm going to show you some of my arts. So for example, we have the population and say, for example, we're looking into inmates, right? So now once I define what an inmate is, I can actually draw from a sample of that population. So if I'm only looking at this type of inmate, I can just draw that population. And now I have my sample. Right. So I have a sample from that population that came from a large population because it would be impossible for someone to test the entire population. Right. So generally we draw samples. Now, whenever you're exposed to a research methods class, you are going to see why this is so significant and what the correct process is to gain good insight on how to draw a sample. But for the time being, this definition will suffice, right? So a sample is simply where the population that we drew from, right? So that piece of information that we drew from. Now, if we go back to our side, notice that here in our article, we were talking about, say, for example, uh, students that were anxious, right? So N generally refers to the population or sample size. So it's telling me that the population, or, or I should say the sample size was 150. And it's telling me that about 60% of all the participants were women. Now, this is immensely important, this section here. What do we mean by, is there any bias? This is immensely important because as I said, the aspect of, of research, the importance of conducting research is that we want to limit bias. We want to be skeptical. We want to make sure that we were using the scientific method in order to conduct our research. But what do we mean by minimizing bias? In this case with populations, we know that the sample, were, they were college students and about 60% were females. Whenever you're looking at research, you want to see whether or not information was used that wasn't necessary. So for example, if we're looking at students who are anxious in a college setting, and we want to see their anxiety in, in regards to test, test, to test taking, as we saw here in this article, let's think about this. Do I care about, say for example, their socioeconomic status? Do I care about, say for example, their sexuality? Do I care about whether or not they work out, right? When we are asking questions to our participants in order to describe themselves, we need to see whether or not these questions are, number one, intrusive? And second of all, are they necessary? Are they actually necessary for you to answer your research question? Or are they necessary for you to understand the direction of the hypotheses? Or is this really going to expand the nature of your research? Is this really going to contribute or not? You never want to ask questions that do not clearly relate to the research question, because generally that means that you're being intrusive. That means that you're also wasting your time in how you are looking at these questions, right? So you want to make sure that questions that you're asking are actually relevant and substantiated for research. Now, by all means, if you think that socioeconomic status is going to have to deal with their test taking anxiety, then by all means, ask that question. But keep in mind, is this substantiated by research? Do you think that this is actually relevant 
to your research question and your hypotheses. You always want to eliminate, eliminate I should say, that, that intrusive um, aspect of research. The same goes for therapy, right? So for example, a person who's a therapist always looks into questions that benefit the client, right? That benefit the progress of their well-being and their treatment plan. So asking questions that are not relevant to the treatment plan or their progress, asking those questions, you need to ask yourself, was that necessary? Was that actually needed for, for the session? And that translates also into research. So that's what we mean, is there bias in me asking these questions to our participants? So now let's go back to our slide. Now, another thing is that here we are asked to describe, we're asked to describe what our procedure was. What do we mean? We are looking into what that design was. So we are looking into over here. So for example, if I'm looking for the design method, we're looking into, we can combine it into a procedure section. So generally, these sections are separated, but in, in some instances, they might be just in one paragraph or one page, but you might see them labeled or you may not. So you're still going to find this information for sure, but you need to remember that you may not necessarily find them all labeled, right? So I do need to, to remind you of that, that you may or may not see them labeled in that sense. Now, another thing that I want to mention is in the method section, you're also going to find the assessment that was used to gather this data, right? So if you remember in this article, we're talking about anxiety, all right? We're talking about how this person, these students were anxious. Okay, so first of all, how do we define anxiety? And second of all, what instrument, what did we use to assess for anxiety? So notice that here you're going to find information on what instrument was used, what type of assessment was conducted. So that's also immensely important to find out what type of, of instruments and things of that nature were used. So that's where you're going to, to find that information. Now, if we move forward to our next slide, it's a continuation of our method. Now, when we are talking about design, right? When we are talking about design, we are referring about a notation of the research plan. What do I mean by that? So if I am talking about, for example, we are comparing two groups, right? So for example, we're comparing a group that received a treatment versus a group that did not receive the treatment. So that's what we're going to have here. We're going to have the, the information of whether or not we gather that information for a group or we are comparing it to another group. So for instance, not necessarily a group that received treatment. Sometimes we have a multi-group comparison. What we mean by that is we're going to have three or more groups that we're looking into in our research article. And we also, we can also have a multifactorial. So what do I mean by multifactorial? We mean that there are multiple factors that we believe are contributing to the, for example, the hypotheses or what changes are we expecting from for that treatment group. So for example, we're looking at in, say for example, anxiety in social class. So that would be two factors, right? And we're looking at how many groups that will create. So notice how in that example, it we will have multiple factors, right? Not just anxiety, but in this case we had, for instance, we had anxiety and social class. Now, something really, really important that I would need to remind you of is correlation. Correlation is simply, we are trying to predict, right? We're trying to predict the relationship between, say, for example, we have a, a variable, right? So we have a predictor, which we generally refer to as the independent, and the criterion, which we generally refer to as the dependent. The independent influences the dependent, right? So this variable is going to influence the next. And a correlation does not imply, does not imply, does not imply, I should say, does not imply causation. Just because something is related doesn't mean it costed, right? So a good example of that, for example, let's think, let's look about this light switch that I have right here, this light switch that it's here. 
there was a correlation between me going up there and turning the switch on and off. There's a relationship between that and this light coming on. But is it causing that? Well, what's causing this is electricity. It's not me touching that switch. Quite the contrary. There was a relationship between me in, in working with this, this switch and this turning on. But notice that the cause was electricity. So just because something is immensely related does not mean it is causing it. It doesn't imply that there is, in fact, a cause. I do want you to keep that in mind. We will look into that much more in, in, in detail in other courses in, in the university, but keep that in mind, okay? It does not imply, if you, take, if you don't take anything else from this slide, is that correlation does not imply causation. Now let's go back to our presentation. So the, something else that I would like to mention, is it's also going to show you the frequency, right? So we're going to, in the methods section, we're going to see the frequency of the data. More importantly, when you're reading a, an article, you need to see whether or not you can identify what variables are being either manipulated, which I like to refer to as the independent, or the variables that are being measured, right? So the dependent variable. And the other thing is ask yourself if in fact this design, so for example, the design that you chose to, to select here, does it in, in fact test the hypotheses? Is this truly the best design that we could have used to answer our research question? To that, of course, it's immensely important. Now, this is an example of the, a, from the same article, and this is an example of the method section. So, for instance, where we have the amount of students that we were talking about earlier. So, for instance, we have the, the amount of students or participants. So, we know that they're undergraduates. We know where we sample from. We know the nature of their participation. So we know it was volunteer. Um, generally, um, these tend to be students who are in undergrad classes. And of course, we see a reward, which is they received some form of credit. Now, here we have the measures. So for example, you see what instrument was used, as I mentioned earlier. Generally, we're going to find what did we use to measure, right? So in this case, we had the the test the test for anxiety and it's explaining what did they use so for example here is our here is the instrument that they decided to utilize which was the test anxiety inventory of course it provides a definition of what this is and it gives us the detailed description as to how uh, the scale ends and it tells us about say for instance the scores the scores that and their range. So notice how the, the measures, it's describing that instrument that we're using. Now, in this particular case, notice that they did divide measures into, we also divided it into procedures, but remember that that may not necessarily be the case. Not all articles require that you, in fact, split these sections into different parts, okay? It doesn't imply that. So what types of materials can you use? What type of information can you utilize for a, an instrument? Well, there's many ways. There's many ways that you can collect data. So for instance, one of them is stimuli, right? It could be any sort of stimuli, for example, light and noise. It could be visual. It could be anything sensory or presenting an object. So for example, if a person feels anxious presenting an object, how does that impact their anxiety? So we can use that to, to measure. Generally, in social sciences, we like to use questionnaires. 
mainly because they're easy to administer and generally they're easy to score. So there's, and you can get a lot of information in one sitting. However, there are limitations to that as with everything that we do in, in the sciences, but nonetheless, it's, it's an interesting method and a very useful method to, to put into practice. We can also use software, right? So not necessarily something in pen and paper, but we can utilize software that is available to gather and collect data. Now, when we move into our next step or our next part of the procedure, or rather the method, I should say, notice that another aspect of this process is the procedure, right? So we, it's another component of our method. So what do I mean? Procedure is simply the, the sequence, the sequence that we are in, in using and employing for our research. So we may present the, this information in a chart. We may present this information in intervals. So for example, how are we presenting this information to the participant, right? Are we showing this information to them in intervals? Are we exposing them to the intervention or the treatment in, in a continuous fashion? So here we're going to see how was the study conducted, basically how to conduct the study. Whereas if we are looking at the materials up here, notice that the materials is basically the what. What did we utilize? to conduct the study, whereas in the procedure sense of things, we're looking as to how did we conduct the study? Why is this important? Why do we have to look into the what and how? It's very simple. Your method has to be clear enough. Your method has to be clear enough and descriptive enough to where any person with the same resources as you, so for example, the same materials, the same time, same participants, the intent is for the person to be able to replicate your study. What do I mean by replicate? Simply what I mean by that is that are going to do your study one more time, as closely as possible, and they won't be able to do that unless you provide a good description in your method. So in the method section, you're going to find what was used, how was it used, and what statistical procedures did they utilize in, in their research? Because if we do everything exactly the same, we should be able to draw the same conclusions, unless there's information that was falsified, information that was misinterpreted, or information that simply is not there, information that it was simply not present, and it was solely conducted to justify research question, then in reality, the methods were a little faulty. So that's why we need to know the what and the how, because we can identify whether or not this was scientifically sound if we were actually able to replicate the study. Now, in this section, I can go back and share our slides. In this section, we're going to focus on the statistics, as I mentioned earlier. The problem is we're only displaying the procedure. I want you to keep that in mind. In the methods section, we are only concerned about the procedure. We're not concerned about results. We are not concerned with what findings that we have. We're solely focused on the procedure. We are not focused on any sort of display of information, statistical data of interpretation. And I do want you to keep that in mind. You're only presenting the procedure in the methods section. You're not presenting any other information at this point. Now, something really important. We're going to move forward to our results. Why, why is this section here? The results are simply there to describe. And I'll say that one more time. The results are only there to describe. They're only going to show us the type of information that we got. What actually did we find? It's very important for you to remember, you are not here, you are not in the results section to explain. You're not here to interpret, you're not here to explain 
How was it related to the research question? What happened to your hypotheses? What type of interpretations do you have? We are not here for that in this section. So the results section is simply telling you, hey, this is the information that I found, but not why that information is there, right? So I'm simply going to give you a description of that data, but I'm not going to tell you why exactly. So it's simply saying, well, you know, I'm six foot five, and I weigh 230 pounds, but I'm not telling you why I weigh 230 pounds. So for example, I'm eating a bunch of burgers. So in this section, you're only and simply telling the, the reader and the consumer of research, you're simply telling them in this section, this is what I found. We don't know why yet, but that's our next section. Okay, so let's focus first on our results. So in our results section, we have different types, different types of information that we're going to show our reader. So the first thing that you're going to see is that descriptive statistic. So we're going to report on that. We're not analyzing. We are simply reporting that information. And what is a descriptive statistic? What do we mean by descriptive statistic? So when we're talking about descriptive statistic, we are talking about the mean, basically another term for an average standard deviation, which is another statistic, basically how far from the mean does the information move from, and our error. Generally, this information is usually presented in a table because it's a little bit easier to understand when we see it in a graphic sense instead of a text, instead of, uh, of a verbiage. Generally, when we present stuff in a table or a figure, generally it's a little bit more, it's easier to understand. Now, the other type of information that you will find in the results is inferential statistics. Now, what are inferential statistics? Inferential statistics include, for example, the information of a t-test. What is a t-test? Generally, this test is conducted when we're trying to find a relationship, right? We're trying to find a correlation. Does this factor relate to the next factor? Now, keep in mind that, like I stated earlier, a a correlation doesn't imply causation. Now, the next inferential statistic. Now, an F statistic is simply it involves whether or not there is an impact from, by, from one variable upon the other. For example, in an experiment. In an experiment, we will look into what information, what variable, or if in fact there was an impact from one variable to the next. Now the next one that I want to talk about is the chi-square. What is a chi-square? It's usually, it's usually used to determine whether there is a statistically significant difference between the expected frequencies versus the observed frequencies. Now, what I mean by this, it, it might sound complicated, but it's actually pretty easy to understand. So I'll give you an example. Say, for example, I want some coffee, right? And the variable here is heat. How hot is this coffee? Now, when I'm drinking my coffee, there might be a difference as to how hot the coffee was and how cold it may be later. But sometimes, even though there's a difference, there might be not such a big significance to where I would notice that change in between being hot and just a little colder. There is a point that I would actually notice that the coffee is cold. But in the meantime, there's a time that I won't notice that that coffee is getting colder. So notice that even though there's a difference in temperature, it might not be significant because I still haven't noticed how cold that coffee is. So this, the chi-square is going to allow us to see whether or not that difference was significant because it may not necessarily be the case. That difference, just because there's a difference and there is an impact from one variable to the other, doesn't mean it's necessarily influential, let's say. It doesn't mean necessarily that it is difficult. Now, in social sciences, something that we do utilize a lot. Now, for those of you who are in the what I call the hard sciences. In, in this sense, the, the statistic for the 
significance of a variable, it's a little higher for the, the natural sciences. Now for the social sciences, we tend to use a little bit lower of a significance. So what do I mean? There's a, a statistic called the p-value, p as in papa. Now the p-value, it's significant because ironically, it involves the significance of a variable about an interaction or about a difference between variables. So what do we mean by it being significant? What's the number? Generally, the number for P is if we have a difference that is less than 0 0.05, meaning that there's a 95% chance that this occurred because of these variables, we can say with some level of certainty, meaning 95%, that there is in fact a significant difference. Whereas in the hard sciences, it tends to be 99. We can say with a 99% of, of confidence, 99% that there is a difference and that it was significant. But for social sciences, because there's so many more factors that involve behavior and things of that nature, we can be that sure. So we tend to use the 95%. Now, if that p-value is less than 0 0.05, and excuse me, that is more than 0 0.05, then, then we cannot be so sure that there was a statistically significant difference. So I did, I did want to mention that, I did want to mention that before we continued. Now, whenever you take your experimental psychology classes or when you take your statistical classes, if you're in psychology or in a related field, and of course, in other sciences as well, they will cover in detail how to conduct a statistical significance analysis for variables, whether it be a correlation or experimentation. So let's go back to our slides. Now, the next thing that you are going to see in the results section, we are going to see what we call the display of data. This display of data that you're going to find is generally you're going to find aspects of how to explain in a graphic sense the information that you have collected, the information that you have found. So generally in articles, you will see figures, you will see tables, but the important part is that you have to include and you will see the figures and tables near the paragraph that it was spoken about. So for example, if you're talking about one type of statistic in page three, you don't want to put that table or that figure in page five. You need them to be close to each other because otherwise it could be lost in translation. It won't show its significance. So notice that you always want to find that table or that figure, you always want it near that paragraph. So this is an example of the results section. So notice how they are giving me, for example, the significance. And as I mentioned earlier, if the significance is less than 0 0.05, then you know that there is a statistical difference. So notice how if we look at their results, notice that they're not interpreting. So for example, they have their mean, as I mentioned earlier, they have their standard deviation, how far from the mean is the data moving towards. And you can also find the p-value. So notice if it's less than 0.05, it means that this finding was significant. So for example, here we have a t-test for these statistics that they ran for anxiety and their students. But if you see here, this p-value is greater, that 0.05 is larger. So it means that this statistic here was not significant. There wasn't a, a big significance between the variables. So notice that there is no interpretation. It's simply telling you, was there a significance? This is the information that we found, but we're not giving you an interpretation of this data about the college students who had test anxiety. Now, this is a figure, and the importance of figures is that it allows us to see the previous information that I was circling here. Notice how we're seeing the same information, but now we're seeing it in, we're seeing it in a figure. We're seeing it graphically displayed. So notice that in this case, there was a statistical significance, and generally in in our displays, if they cross, if that data, 
process, then we know that there was in fact a statistical significance. Now, again, whenever you do take your statistics class, this is going, you're actually going to conduct your own research and find out the data sets and whether or not they're significant. Also, if you're taking a research class, you'll also be able to conduct this type of research. Now, here is the part where you will actually be conducting an interpretation, which is the discussion. Here is where you finally will come across the interpretation of your data. This is where you'll actually, all that information that you just presented, this is where you will explain, will interpret. And remember, we talked about in the introduction that in the introduction, we're going to find theoretical models. You're going to use those theoretical models that you explained and that you use or that you found in the introduction of a research article or for your own research. This is where you're going to finally utilize them and have some interpretation for the data that you just collected. So we go back to our slide. Notice that in here, we are going to explain what happened, what exactly happened, and why did it happen. This is immensely important because here we're going to find out, okay, this is the information that you presented. What value does it have? What actually happened with that information? So if you remember my example from earlier, you know, me saying I'm 6'5 and I'm 230 pounds, then now I'm telling you why am I 6'5 and why am I 230 pounds? So for example, I eat a lot of burgers, all of my relatives are, are tall people. So notice how here is where I'll actually provide an explanation based on the data that I found. So now, in this section, we're also going to be worried about how the results answer that research question. So if you remember in our introduction, we presented our research question and hypotheses, but in the discussion se section, we're actually going to see whether or not our research question was answered. Do we have a prediction through our hypothesis? If in fact that actually happened because you can also sometimes come across research that simply did not, did not accommodate that research question. You'll find out that after all of that process, you simply did not find enough evidence to substantiate your research. And although that might sound like a bummer, sometimes that could actually be a good thing because you can say, well, you know, if this is completely different to what I was expecting, it could mean two things. It can mean your research design was poor, you didn't conduct the right statistics, or you didn't collect data correctly, so something went wrong along the way. Or if everything went correctly and everything was done correctly, then maybe you found something brand new. Now, the chances of that are pretty slim because there's other people before you that have conducted research. But nonetheless, it's a possibility and it could happen, whether because you made a mistake along the way or because there is in fact some merit to this study that we just have never seen before. So keep that in mind. If the research question was in fact answered. Now, if we go back to our slide, something that I would like to mention is that in this section, in the section of the discussion, we're also going to find the limitations. We are going to find what was difficult what was a problem? What was a downfall of our research? What in fact did not go as planned? Or what was something that you simply did not have the ability to do? So for instance, maybe a limitation, for example, with the college students that we were talking about earlier, maybe the limitation is where the sample was collected from that population. Maybe you want it to include uh, other people, for example, foreign students, maybe they have more anxiety, maybe they don't have as much as test anxiety than other people. So notice how here you're going to find out what went wrong. You want to tell the, the person who reads the, the research article, hey, this was a problem. This was a, a downfall during our research. You may think, I don't want to tell them that. Well, first of all, the, the importance of finding limitations in your work 
is that if you have identified these limitations correctly, then you'll be able to interpret the results better because you know, I need to be careful because I had this limitation. So whenever I interpret my results in the discussion section, I'll be able to see and say whether or not that was an impact. So you need to remember that limitations are important. Now, something really interesting for you as a consumer, whenever you decide to do your own research, something immensely important is that in the discussion, you're going to find future research suggestions. And this is great. Why is this so great? Because now you don't have to scavenge for ideas as to what should I write my research about? Because here is a scientific journal telling you, hey, this is what future research needs to focus on. So it's basically presenting you, hey, this is what you should study, tied up with a little nice bow at the top. Because I am telling you, hey, this is what you should look into. So for example, if I only focus in, say in the example that I gave earlier, about let's talk about just uh, inmates, right? But I only focus on say, for example, Caucasian inmates, maybe next time I want to focus with focus on Hispanic. So that would be a suggestion for future research because yes, this, I conducted this study, but now I want to move towards the next person that picks up my literature and decides to build upon it. Hey, a good suggestion would be, hey, look into other types, uh, or another racial makeup, I should say, for this particular research. So notice that here it, here it is, whenever you have to pick data and, and have a research idea, look for the limitations and look for future research because you could be the person that addresses that limitation or that can contribute to future research. So it's immensely important that you look into this section if you are in, in fact interested in conducting your own research. Now let's go back to our slide. Now, another thing about the discussions, discussion section, I should say, is that it generally ends with a small summary. It generally ends with what happened, what information do we have, and this is what we found, and this is why we think it happened, right? So it generally, it does have an explanation. Something really important, however, is you as a consumer of these research articles, ask yourself, was that explanation reasonable? Does this in fact substantiate what I'm saying? Did the information that I find, can I truly use it for what I am talking about? Is it truly substantiated? Is it truly reasonable to draw that conclusion, right? So keep that in mind, whenever you're reading an article or whenever you are writing your own data, I need you to understand that whenever you are drawing an interpretation, think about, is it truly in fact reasonable? Do I have enough evidence to substantiate my claim? Now here we have an example of a discussion, right? So in this section, you're going to find a brief summary, a description of those variables. You're going to find the hypothesis. So notice how as test anxiety increase, temptation inhibited implementations, intention increasingly benefit their performance. So notice how we found the data. We found what we were looking for. We're trying to see whether or not there was a relationship. Now, we can also draw our conclusions. So here we have a conclusion to our interpretation. So here we find this suggests that the students who experience text anxiety benefit forming, benefit from forming, I should say, implementation intentions to ignore distractions and the continuation of their interpretation. So notice that we have the information, we have the interpretation. And also why, for example, is it substantiated? So notice that they're giving you, okay, this is why we drew a conclusion and this is why we think it's substantiated because of past research, what it actually has shown. Now, the last part that we are going to find in a research paper, any type of research paper or journal article is the reference section. Now, the reference section is immensely important. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, we can find out whether or not you just made stuff up and you actually weren't honest about your research. But more importantly, it gives us an understanding of what 
basis, what information, what literature review, where did you find this information to conduct your own study? So notice that here, we're going to find information that you indeed utilized to form the background and your theoretical, theoretical, I should say, foundations for your study. Now, interestingly, this might be the most important part for you, for the person who wants to conduct research. So if we go back to our slide, notice that you're going to find all those sources that were cited in the actual paper. But importantly, you could use the reference section for your own references. So you're going to be able to use this information to find information if you yourself want to find new information for new research. So this is a great way to find articles that you can use for your own research. And it's already there with a little bow tied at the top of it, just like a little present. It's already there and you can look into these sources yourself. Now, as I said, science is about its skepticism. So something you want to look into is when they are citing, are they only citing papers from their own lab, from people that they know or a source they're affiliated with? Or are they using top tier journals, journals who have a very limited acceptance and they have a lot of scrutiny for their peer review? And you're also going to find, again, the DOI. So if you want to pull up that article by yourself, you can always use their DOI to pull that information up. So here we have an example of the sample references. So for instance, notice that it's, it's in alphabetical order. So we started with the primary person that had the earliest letter, and of course it was the letter A. And something that I do need you to notice, however, is that it has a hanging indent. So basically this indent here, so notice that the top is, is in the very flush to the left, but then the rest of it is not. And generally in social sciences, particularly with APA or the American Psychological Association's formatting and style guidelines, they, this is generally what they suggest. So basically this little hanging indent here to where basically the rest of the citation is hanging from the last name. So notice that some people prefer to use, so last name, um, first and middle, some people don't use all of their initials. So for example, this person here doesn't publish with any middle name. So it's, it's significant to see how exactly do they use their, their name and especially when you decide to publish your own, how are you going to use your, your name in research? Now, generally, most articles will require that you use your legal name. Um, some people um, choose not to, uh, but generally, uh, it's more of a consensus that you would use your name. So hopefully, this lecture has helped you in understanding research, understanding how to read research. What am I going to find? How can I use it for myself? Or how can I eventually when I conduct my own research, what am I expected to do? So hopefully this art, this presentation, I should say, helped you with that type of understanding. And I hope you have a great day and see you next time. Bye-bye.